Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live, the weekly online event from the Nebraska Library Commission, where we talk about uh, anything and everything of interest to libraries. I'm your host today for this month's episode of Tech Talk. I'm Michael Sowers, the Technology Innovation Librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission, and I am really, really excited about today's session. Um, some of you may know I uh, personally do a blog called The Travel and Librarian, which means I, I travel not as much as I used to, but as much as I can. And um, I got to say that uh, in my travels, I meet lots of interesting people, one of whom we have on the show with us today. Uh, before we get into that, just our little bit of housekeeping. Uh, if you have any questions during the show, feel free to type them into the questions area of GoToWebinar. Uh, also, if you have a microphone attached and you would like to ask a question, we will uh, feel free to raise your hand and I can turn your microphone on for that. Generally, we uh, leave the questions for uh, the end of our guest presentation, but if you you know feel free to submit them through the Q and A. Uh, as you have them, and I will happily pass them along to our guest. So back in 2008, in that summer, so almost five years ago, I was uh, lucky enough to be invited to speak at the ACURAL conference, which is the Association of Caribbean University Research and Institutional Libraries in Jamaica. And one of the sessions I attended was called the Internet Social Networking and Information Literacy, and one of the gentlemen on that panel was Mark Shane Scale, our guest today. Uh, Mark Shane is from Kingston, Jamaica. He has his Master's in Library and Information Studies from the University of the West Indies, and he is currently pursuing his PhD at the University of Western Ontario in London, Ontario, Canada. Uh, welcome, Mark Shane. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, yeah, I, I have been kind of uh, following Mark. I don't know if he remembers actually meeting me at the conference, but we, I, I definitely, Mark. I have not forgotten you. <laughs> oh, okay, thank you. Uh, we kind of stayed in touch on, on Facebook on and off, and I read his blog, Small Island Librarian, which I, I highly recommend. It's probably the only blog I read where he actually cites his sources and has a, a bibliography at the end of most posts. And um, we... Uh, one of these projects uh, I heard about that he's working on lately is called Narrating the OPAC, and I thought that sounded really interesting, and I wanted to hear more. So I've invited him uh, on the show today to uh, give his talk and, and explain to us what, what he means by narrating the OPAC. So Mark Shane, why don't you just uh, introduce yourself, give us a little bit about your background, and, and take it away. Thank you much, Michael. Yes, I, as Michael said, I'm from Kingston, Jamaica, and... I'm currently here in um, Canada, in cold north, <laughs> to do my PhD. And one of the projects that I'm working on, or that I'm interested in, is storytelling and narrative analysis, especially how librarians can use it to improve our communications, our online communications. And so today I want to talk to you a bit about narrating the OPAC. How can storytelling and narrative analysis improve the user friendliness of our flagship, what I consider the flagship product of the library service um, or online public access catalog, the OPAC. So, so basically my goal, I am often, I'm persuaded that libraries and librarians have many stories to tell and we have rich sources in our collection that we want our users to find out about. So my goals are to basically to persuade you to think about our catalog differently and see how we can narrate our collections through the OPAC and per perhaps get us to see the broader perspective, how we can apply storytelling to all our library communication, especially online. And my premise, basic pre premise is that while new media and technologies create new forms of storytelling, we can still incorporate ancient storytelling practices that can impact design and development of new technologies. So even though we have the Facebook, the Storify, the, the Blogger, the YouTube that are telling stories, that people are using to tell stories, we can adapt those same storytelling principles to um, our own online communication. Organizations are now creating online narratives if you saw this article in the New York Times where Coke is Coca-Cola, the company is revamping its website 
to basically tell its story. So it's making its website more into like an engaging online magazine. So persons can actually see, get a story out of it. So it's, they're changing the way that they create their, and tell their story online. And I believe that libraries too can actually adopt those principles. So my question is, can the same principles be applied to informing the design of the library's OPAC? Traditionally, our OPAC has been considered a resource discovery tool that tells a narrative about human knowledge, a narrative of the knowledge accessible through the library. So let's look at the literature a bit. Storytelling, genres of science fiction, folklore, and even mythology has impacted the development of new technologies such as the Space Age program. NASA um, got a lot of its insight into how to design its spacecraft from science fiction as well as the Old Testament Bible. Various works indicate that storytelling narrative can be applied to technology for purposes of information provision. There are some per, um, research done that shows that you can use um, folkloric principles to organize how we communicate and document information regarding new software, etc. Within our own field, our own literature, our narratives and storytelling, I want to start with Bates who talks about the berry picking theory, uh, or berry picking idea. She argues that online databases are not designed for how people actually conduct searches. Rather than searching for a one query to, to a one result to answer our questions, people usually pick up fragments of information from various sources, and they construct a final story in their mind to organize the bits of bits and pieces of information that they collect from various sources. Also, the sense making theory, the urban sense making metaphor, discusses the fact that narratives and stories are some of the means by which people reduce uncertainty and bridge information gap and meet their information needs. Also, Fisher's theory of the information grounds discusses that we create spaces where we exchange stories along with information. So stories and information go together. It's, that story can create the opportunity for information seeking to take place. So let's look at some literature on stories. All right. For, educa for education, it has been acknowledged that the way that people approach new knowledge acquisition is through the reliance of stories from others, usually experts, combined with their own experience in order to learn something new. As it relates to organizational, organizational storytelling, Boshe gives definition of stories and he usually argues that stories are not one narrator or one voice, but usually a multitude of voices. Gabriel also gives a definition of stories, arguing that stories are not necessarily factual, but are wish-fulfilling fantasies between fiction and reality. They might be reality-based, but not necessarily truth or facts, but may, might be the artful manipulation of facts. So let us look at the OPAC. Uh, usually, when we keep computer scientists look at the computer, they, they consider it a tool. But this author, Laurel, critiques the metaphors of the computer as a tool and proposes instead the metaphor of the computer as a medium. Secondly, if we talk, think about Fisher's information grounds idea, a liminal space for the exchange of stories as well as information, and we combine it with Laurel's idea that our computers are not tools but a, med but a medium, that we can have a new view of the OPAC, not as a tool of resource discovery, but as a medium facilitating storytelling about humanity's knowledge, as well as facilitating, facilitating resource discovery. So I want to look at some technology prototypes for storytelling. Generally, we are accustomed to the first person journalistic narratives in digital storytelling, which usually includes either video performance, or text and images, usually photographs. And then there are the timeline, timeline approaches, where there's a beginning, middle, and end. And you can scroll through to see how a story unfolds. But today, I want to focus on two main prototypes that I feel have 
great relevance to even our OPAC. Let's start with Laurel, who wrote the book Computers as Theater. And she focuses on fictional personal storytelling. Now, Laurel developed this prototype for a multimedia database where people navigate the database not through clicking through links, but actually through three characters, three Asian characters that guide persons to the different information in the database. These three characters embody three different perspectives. There's the frontiersman, a Native American, a Native American, and a settler woman. And they both guide people to different sources or, or viewpoints about the history of the North American, uh, well, American in expansion. The, so these agents are cast as storytellers and they performed in video formats. And they represented and presented and provided context for the information sources in the database. The sources of these accounts were derived from diaries and journals of real historical persons that experienced the expansion. And they dealt with the first person narrative account of these incidents and topics. These agents, they introduce themselves via video describing their real life professions, the source materials used, and lessons learned. And according to Laurel, this established agents as storytellers rather than fictitious characters, thereby reinforcing their credibility. They, again, they, we, we talked about them represented very, um, viewpoints and multiple representation of events and knowledge within the database or the knowledge base. Laurel argues that this approach is natural in that the real world, in the real world, human beings do not navigate to information, but rather experience information coming to them from a variety of sources, especially in the case, like, we, for example, we talk to people. When we are talking to people, natural flow of information takes place. Somebody tell you their story, and from their story you get uh, insight about all different things or a different world or a different point of view. So again, Laurel argues that this is no, it's more natural to represent information through these narrative characters rather than having people click through links. Other prototype of great interest to, to me, as I see so many applications to libraries, not just to our OPAC, but even to the way that we tell stories about our spaces, is the Lombardo and Damiano's Cultural Heritage Spider Tour Guide. They have a spider tour guide uh, with a fictional Italian anthropomorphic spider who acts as a virtual guide to a historical site. But this one is designed for mobile devices. So Carlito represents the, the interface of the application and he guides the visitors touring an old Italian palace. He's a single character narrator and he performs dramatically, communicating both fact and fiction about the places and objects within the site. Now, Carletto being based on the mobile phone, when a person steps into, a, when a person step into a, a, one room of the palace, he comes up on the phone and he tells persons about the room. And he gives them facts about the rooms and, and, and the books and, and also tells them about his own fictional story of, as a spider and what he, uh, or his family his, uh, and what they did in the room. So it makes it quite very interesting. With Carlito, the fictional world is superimposed on the real world. He follows the visitors by a webcam by which he can give contextually relevant information to the current room in which the visitor occupies. The user being present in the room is an input to Carlito to provide information on the location. And so he reacts to the user's location on the mobile screen through scripts that are pre-written. And not all information is provided at once. In case a person um, goes back to another room that they just came from, um, so Carlito has some more information to give them, some new new information to give them about that room, and it's and developers use an ontological approach to fragment communicative knowledge into units from which from the most general to specific. So using those two prototypes, Laurel and Lombardo and Damiano. What can we learn from, the, from them? The idea of representing viewpoints in our information sources. 
Secondly, we could learn that nonfiction information can be presented by imposing combining fictional representation with real world factual information. That such an effort can create an unforgettable experience for those who also access the information. For example, with Lombardo and Damiano's prototype, people remember the spider and they were attached to the spider and, and they remember the story of the, the, the palace based on their attachment to that personal character of the, 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 the spider's tour guide. So, my method. I decided to do a query to find information resources on restaurants. And I designed two narratives. What the first narrative, it's fictional. It's based on imagination about how the world should be. I would call it's considered similar to the philosophy's thought experiment. It's a sense making of future possibilities using historical advances. Then there's also the second narrative, which is created from dialogue with an artificial intelligent conversational agent. Um, these are not so intelligent as at the moment, but I use it to base the storytelling on and modify the agent's response to more interesting and relevant responses. Uh, the second narrative is more sense making of the present about how the world currently operates and some of the problems. So let's go to my first narrative. Fictional story. In a parallel universe, John, a designer, steps into the virtual public library to use its online catalogs to search for information resources on restaurants. He types into the search box and launches into his search. On analysis, he realizes that the library's catalog retrieves three categories of results, nonfiction, life writing sources, and fiction sources. Under nonfiction results, John sees the following. Magazines and newspaper articles, which review great restaurants or feature of news features on restaurants. Books, hospitality industry textbooks, food and beverage service textbooks. And scholarly journal articles. Under life writing sources, John sees the following results. Autobiographies or biographies books and newspaper articles, company documents and publications from restaurants and industry and trade associations for restaurant service providers. Analysis of the results that John sees. So let's pause and analyze these results. Each category of the results reflect various viewpoints on restaurants, such as the insider within the restaurant business. Yes, uh, that, that is usually re reflected in their memoirs, autobiographies, or biographies. The scholar studying the restaurant business, more in the scholarly journals, or even the hospitality textbooks. The administrator wanting insights into restaurant management. Or the customer that's, that just wants to find a particular restaurant to check out. Further analysis reveals more viewpoints. Someone who wants to explore career opportunities in, restu in a restaurant. They want to find out about the life stories of restaurant employees or even founders. A journalist who wants to cover a story in restaurants might want to, might, be, might wish to know what is already out there. So right away we see there are a number of viewpoints that could be harnessed from our collection. I now turn over to Michael to, to play the, the, the journalist, if you try Laura's approach to presenting such results, what are some of the ways we could see the results presented? Go, go over, over to you, Michael. <laughs> Hi, I am Jay McDonald, a journalist from the Public Library Press. I have a number of media articles on restaurants to bring to your attention. Breaking news on trends in the restaurant industry, reviews and reports of restaurants, and special news features on restaurants. Thank you very much, Michael. So. And there are other perspectives. You could present the, the, the video presentation of the Jack McDonnell, a professor at the Public Library School of Hospitality. And he could talk, talk about the hospitality base, the more scholarly base resources. We could have Che Chin, the restaurant owner. And he could talk about the biographies and the autobiographies and other life writing sources. We could have Jay Fisher, the customer of restaurants, who would talk about the reviews and restaurants, tips on etiquette, t 
tips for eating out at restaurants, consumer guides. And there are a variety of viewpoints that we could represent as nar as nar with, with different narrators. And there's also a practical application of results page. We could potentially uh, use a solution of face Facebook's principle of view as a specific person. So that person could view the results um, based on the type of narrator that, that more represents what they are looking for or the information source that they, 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 are, they, are, they want to find. Next, we move to narrative two. So, an actual, actual, an actual search in the real world. Let me tell you about what happened to me the other day when I was, was searching the library catalog of the London Public Library. I hear that England is a great place. No, not that London. London in Canada. I'm sorry. First thing that comes to mind when I think London is England with tea and scones. Anyway, the other day I experimented with the library's online catalog and typed in restaurants. And in my analysis of the results, I noticed that the first assumption of the system is that the user wants non-fiction information. Books are listed first, and then articles. Isn't that something you would expect? But the person using the library catalog may not want to see non-fiction first. I'm quite sure that the system provides some way of filtering results so that you can find just fiction. To be fair, I also noticed that to one side, one can select format, fiction, picture book, DVD, etc. But still, that might not be sufficient. I checked out the nonfiction section, for example, for a life writing source and curiously noted the title, Writing in Restaurants by David Mamet. So I checked it out on Amazon to see what it was about as well as any reviews on the book. Here's what I found based on Amazon's book description. You see, titles are often misleading. The book entitled Writing in Restaurants by Mamet has nothing to do with restaurants at all. While the book is indeed nonfiction, it is more life writing or reality based and should not, in my view, be confused in the nonfiction information category. Next, I checked the fiction category. The key to my observation was whether or not I could find a fictional work set in a restaurant setting. For this, I saw a few results that matched what I was expecting to find. Like these two resources that showcase fiction stories in restaurants. So I clicked on the title Simmer Down and further found the library in its subject description as a category for restaurants under fiction. I'm not sure persons would be looking for fiction works based on settings. I don't think that would be a normal expectation for any fiction reader. Perhaps not, but do you also see that this fiction book contains recipes? Wouldn't that be useful information for somebody? Hmm, I get you. So people can find non-fiction information out of supposedly fiction books. That's right. But I still had some unanswered questions. Like what? How do we observe reality-based writing, or more accurately, life writing set in a restaurant setting? What is provided by the system to facilitate discovery of restaurant life writing? In my view, there's no direct ways provided to the user to locate autobiographies and memoirs of, uh, memoirs of restaurant CEOs, owners, or employees in book formats if they do not already know the titles or authors. But I'm sure one can modify the query to get more specific results. You're right. Indirectly, one can expand the query term restaurant and include another term with it. Story. <laughs> Stories have a representational value, placing information in the context of viewpoints. Another point that I want to summarize from our learning is that storytelling also makes sharing and accessing information an experience. My major conclusion is that we can tell stories about our, 
collections. And I ask four questions for the OPAC of the future. One, can we have fictional, imaginary, historical, or even real characters as narrators representing the perspective or perspectives of information resources or knowledge available through the library? Two, can we combine a timeline view for browsing purposes or use a view as interface to filter the results that, come in our, that, that show up in our catalog? catalog searches. Three, can we base narrators on the demography of our users, creating characters that are imagined experts or others that represent people that users would consult for advice based on their task requirements? Four, can we represent the dialogic, dialogic voices or disagreements or disputes over knowledge neutrally without taking sides and let the users decide which voice or voices to listen to? There are other questions and issues. Can such principles be used for information literacy sessions and training? And all issues that once exposed, users may no longer want, need a storytelling tutorial or guide to use the OPAC. They might, after one exposure, they might understand very well how our OPAC works and the, and the types of resources they can get. So another question though, should the OPAC storytelling be an opt-in or opt-out experience, considering that some users are already experts and do not need guidance. So these are some of the questions and issues that I raise based on the the actual look at the literature and how we can um, potentially apply uh, storytelling to our narratives. So I now open the floor for comments, criticisms, and queries or questions. Wow, that Mark Shane, thank you for that. I'm I'm. I, I wrote some stuff down and I'm I'm still trying to put together my questions because there's there's <laughs> so much here to to I mean you've got me thinking and I, I, so I'm trying to put them together. I will remind everybody who's listening in live. Uh, please you know feel free to submit your questions in the uh, questions area or uh, raise your hand and uh, I can turn on your microphone for you. Um, let Let's start with maybe an easy one at least for me to ask um, while I try to put together the rest of my uh, thoughts on this. Very early on in your presentation, you mentioned uh, that databases are not designed based on how people actually search. Um, maybe for our audience, this, this, this might be preaching to the choir, but could you expand upon that just a little bit? What, what, what do you mean by that? OK. Well, actually, it comes from Bates, who argues that we design databases to, to, uh, to deliver results to a single question or query that um, somebody, exp somebody types into the search box. And the results that, and the basically the results that persons access, um, we don't take into consideration the fact that we, we don't necessarily want a single source. We're not searching just for a single source. You want to see different sources and pick some things from some and some things from the other. You perhaps want to even look at a, a source and, and, and go through its bibliography, its references, and citations to other sources. The way that we want to use the results um, you know, from, a, from a database search is not necessarily um, done based on how it, 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 the way, we, way that it's designed is not done how we actually want to use the results. It doesn't make it um, easy to use. We still have to, to navigate from what we can only view one source at, at a time and so on. Yeah, but um, basically, again, how people actually find, use information is that we take fragments from one source, fragments from another source, fragments from a number of sources, and we combine them. We, we use different parts of it. Sorry. Oh, yeah. well, that's fine. <laughs> I hope I answered your question. Yeah, no, no. that. that... That was good. Um, I, I, I guess here's my other large question. This is the one I'm, I'm just myself having trouble um, putting together. So if I ramble a little bit, but please, please forgive me. Um, y you keep no saying um, OPAC, which, which I get. But as you were describing it, my mind kept wandering to more databases of like primary source material, like here in Nebraska, we have Nebraska Memories, which is scanned documents and That's photographs right. where we have, um, wh whether it's actually indexable or not, we have the full text of the content, whereas in your 
traditional OPAC today. We have records, yes. but not the actual content. How how much more would you need to add to a, an OPAC record to make something like this work? I mean, are, are the subject headings enough, or, or would we have to start putting in content? Okay, good question, Michael. Uh, well, again, I, as, I, as, as I see, I recognize that this sort of principles can apply to all databases that libraries have, especially um, archives who have collections that you want to tell users about. Um, so, but for the for even our OPAC, uh, we already have reviews. Although we be careful of Amazon reviews, definitely, definitely we have subject headings. Uh, we already do some level of details, providing um, t t talking about what the different materials provide. Um, we have, I think, some some amount of data that we can actually use to start the process, but still. We could um, we could actually put in a bit more content to give more perspective to the source. Yeah, we 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 could give more context of the source, um, the, especially the narrate the point of view. You need to, need to, because one thing that I know that libraries need to do, we can provide signals of content to our materials um, already for movies and so on. People we know about rating system that. Advise people about the type of contents that whether it's boiling graphic um, content, etc. I think libraries could adopt a similar principle and provide some certain signals that give users um, some idea about the type of content that is in our works um, beyond what we normally do. Uh, we could talk about this. Well, I I'm not I'm out of ideas now, but definitely <laughs> I see that more. We have to put our information resource, not just the subject headings, but we have to put it into a greater context that will give users the clues about what to expect if they access this um, resource, what fragments of information they can take out of it. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So. Um, and and when when you were talking about the um, the dramatic spider, which I I is making me laugh every time I think dramatic spider, <laughs> um, and and similar tours of museums that, that I've been on where you, you get kind of a similar system where you, you have the headset on and as you walk through the museum you, it knows where you are um, and but most of that seems to be or definitely is kind of pre-recorded canned material and it's just playing back to you the material based on where you are how much okay. How much kind of, for lack of a better term, artificial intelligence do you see would have to be built upon that to kind of get to what I think is where you're trying to ultimately go? Okay. Again, <laughs> narratives. Yeah, we have to put it, infuse it with some more narratives that will connect to people, characters, um, mm -hmm. not just presenting. Um, non-fiction information, but a little fiction information to create an experience out of that um, entire uh, uh, tour of um, our sites. Again, we, we can, it's about creating that character mm -hmm. that people cannot, that can appease the people and a, a storyline as well, that the, the, the character can communicate a story as well as provide non-fiction information. We want to mix, combine, combine both a little um, entertainment, you know, and a little um, education. We want to do both, you know, to to make the it's not just an experience where you're just learning, but you're also connecting it to a real or imaginary experience of somebody else, an imagined other, uh, mm -hmm. who is telling you their story as well, or getting you to see the objects or whatever um, you are viewing in another way. Yeah, but just but not just putting information. They're not, not just pushing out information out there. Yeah, again, we have to make it an experience. Uh, getting persons to to connect because uh, we connect to people when we hear people's stories. Right. Yes, and, I mean. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and and something just popped into my head to maybe I'm 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 now trying to figure out like how could you do something like this right now? And what's popping into my head is sometimes. Um, Kind of a, maybe the simplest level I can think of is a, a book trailer for a piece of fiction or even nonfiction 
um, where I've seen some that are done not just saying, hey, you should go read this book, but it's actually like a character introducing, a character from the, the work introducing themselves and maybe taking, right. if, if that's on YouTube and then just, you know, linking to that or embedding that right into the record for that book adds that little bit of narrative and adds that little bit of context. That's right. That's it. That's a good <laughs> idea, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, 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 it's 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 starting to form in my head. I'm getting it. All right. Um, and um, one other question. A, a few months ago on, on this show, we had um some of the folks from the University of Nebraska Lincoln Love Library uh here in Lincoln, where they have a uh a, an artificial intelligence interface to kind of do online reference called Pixel. Are you familiar with that? Uh, no, I'm not familiar with Pixel. What I'm familiar with the artificial intelligence, um, well, um, conversational agents. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's so kind of a chatbot. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, yes, a chatbot. Right. 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 So Pixel. Okay. So I'll, no, I'll look up that one now. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, so, I think. Yes, um, go ahead. Oh, you go ahead. Uh, yeah, I think it's pixel.unl.edu. Yeah. yeah, you should be able to fi find that. I think I think there's a possible connection here because they 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 pixel kind of has a personality, and and you can even insult her and That's she right. will refuse to answer until you apologize. It, it, it's it's quite interesting. Um, the the uh, remind our, our live attendees if you have any questions, uh, uh, feel free to put type them into the the questions area or raise your hand. I can turn on your microphone. Um, the the one other one I had specific uh, to this project that I wrote down here is, have you spoken to uh, and maybe this is you know further down the road definitely, but have you spoken to anybody who actually creates ILSs yet about these ideas and and working them into actual products? No, not yet. Okay. I'm not. <laughs> not yeah, not not as yet. Yeah. Okay. Work, I'm still working on the ideas. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, still working progress. <laughs> get, get the PhD first, then go talk to the the vendors. <laughs> <laughs> All right, no problem, no problem. All right. uh, I, don't, I don't have to wait to get it. I just need to get more more record, recognition from the scholars. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Hey, that, that's great. Mm -hmm. Um. So let me let me switch views on you here a little bit. Um. In in uh, from some of the other things you've you've written on on your blog, uh, not specifically related to this project, and one actually is your your latest blog post, and, and I just want to ask you a question or two about uh, some of the things you wrote. It's it's titled "What Should the Library's Primary Priority Be in This Time of Austerity and Digital Media?" Right, right. And and you you talk about some of the more creative things that have been making the news that libraries are doing lately. Um, range, ranging from uh, uh, there was a uh, how to slaughter a pig at one library and another uh, library that was teaching pole dancing. Okay, so uh, right. that definitely kind of the extremes uh, uh, of examples. <laughs> and and I I'm, I'm going to quote uh, just about three sentences of what you said, and then I want I want would like you to talk about it a little more. Um, what what the first part was in my view, such libraries are selling their souls for worldly gain. Um, and then near the end you say, however, I am convinced that the path that many libraries are taking is not in our own interest. Paths to making the library an institution that provides entertainment as our major service is, in my opinion, the wrong direction. Libraries should not continue to feed consumerism habits and users that are uncritical consumers of entertainment products. Leisure and recreation, while part of our mission, should not be the primary mission our goal pursued. Now, I, I won't say whether I agree or disagree here, but but that that that's some pretty strong language. So I, I just wanted to maybe if you could fill me in on 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 why you've come to that conclusion. Well, because I, I, if you are if well, I'm somehow connected to the entrepreneur world or the business world. Not, not, I'm not in business, but but I. If you, if I understand the the culture of business and the culture of entrepreneurs and the culture of the administrators who will be running running and funding the libraries uh, of uh, the my views are the more we align ourselves to leisure leisure and, and entertainment and recreation um, is the more that the, those who fund us are going to be 
in conflict with what we are doing, especially especially since um, we ha the recreation industry, the leisure or entertainment industry, is worth a lot of money, billions of dollars, and we have different um, and it's supposed to be an industry. It's again, our library is competing against a business industry. It, it is a major question. Once once we find out if we are competing with a business industry, those who fund us, um, they will question basically the funding that they, the need for us, or relevance in the funding. Mm -hmm. However, if we are seen as adding value to the, not competing against industry, but adding value to the economy, um, add like creating workers, creating new innovation, creating new um, small businesses, and so on. There, there's less question of our relevance. There's less um, business persons are on boards or, or, what, or even in government to, uh, to say, to question whether or not we need libraries. That's, that's just my, my concern and fear, because I, I see if libraries continue going towards recreation to pull people, persons in, up, um, we are going to be coming against industry, the, the, that, that industry, and we know the power of industries and lobbies in politics, we, and I, so it's it's all, I, I see it as a as a, that we we need to perhaps know, straighten out our priorities and know that yeah we we have we we want to continue to exist, we want to continue to to give value to persons and to develop our communities, and we should go that appropriate way, the appropriate way of, of um, uh, ensuring that we, or those who fund us and those who have the money and the power uh, will, will, all, will see our relevance and not question it. That's it. <laughs> sure. No, no, that's great. I, and like I said, you're, you've, uh, again, given, I, I, I'm not, I'm not sure I have an opinion yet. I, I completely, I, I get your argument. I, I also get the, the arguments that, that say, you know, it, it, kind of do what your patrons want and if that's what they want, but you do have to consider the opinions of the folks who are funding you also. That That, that, that is very important. Darme on, on the line said, uh, libraries have always competed, and she puts competed in quotes with bookstores. Um, so, you know, yeah, there has kind of been that traditional competition with business on a certain level. Um, I know of a lot of libraries uh, in the past that you know didn't uh, stock videos because they didn't want to compete with the local video store, um, and now we start looking at talks regarding with um, uh, reselling of uh, digital materials and and ma digital materials expiring after 26 checkouts and various things. There there are a lot of issues here, um, and 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 definitely your your your. Uh, your point of view is very well thought out. I, I can't argue with it on its merits. Uh, I mean, it's. I, I definitely see where you're coming from on that. It is something we definitely have to think about. Um, so I, I don't see any other questions coming in from the audience. Uh, Mark Shane, I want to uh, thank you very much for this. This was wonderful, and and I'm I, I'm going to be thinking about this <laughs> a lot. I think in the thank future. You. It, it, well, it is. That's the goal. If we can think about it, right? Um, it, it's good. That's good. That's the goal. Because again, these are just ideas on the surface. Um, the literature is clear that you know the organizations are moving to creating online presence that tell stories. Mm -hmm. uh, we see infographics movement um, growing. Yeah. So a lot of storytelling is taking place online, and libraries. We need to start thinking how can we um, evolve and go into go where the technology is going where people are expecting us to go right and um, where where if people want to follow along with with what you're doing uh, and and uh, writing on in the future where where should they go online for that what's the best way to, to follow All right two places you can go to Twitter M scale um, yeah at M scale uh, or you can go to my blog subscribe to my blog oh, sorry about the Google reader um, <laughs> cancellation. <laughs> I'm going to talk about that momentarily. Um, <laughs> but, uh, well, I don't know. Google, that's, that's the thing. We can't fully depend upon Google for all, all our services because, mm -hmm. again, they, they, will, they will cut some. They will 
they are business, so they are going to do what they feel they need to do. That's why we. <laughs> that's why libraries have to develop archives and other thing uh, and, and uh, other things that that will keep certain resources that we are not fully dependent on any business. Um, right. We have to to maintain our own collection. We still have to um, uh, back up all that. <laughs> yeah. Well, but, but, um, my blog, small island librarian, and my uh, my Twitter account M at M Scale. All right, I'm going to quick take uh, control back here, and actually I do have your blog up on my screen here, so everybody should be seeing that momentarily along with my little smiling face in the corner here. Uh, yes, yeah, smallislandlibrarian.blogspot.com. Come, excuse me. Uh, Mark Shane, thank you once again uh, and for that presentation. Like I said, I think you've given us uh, lots and lots to think about. So, uh, folks, I just want to spend another couple of minutes. What I usually do at the end of each of these tech talks is just uh, give you some kind of tips and tricks and some websites that I found and some news. And so uh, I will switch over to uh, my uh, delicious account here for this month's links. And uh, we will be providing all of these links in the show notes, so you don't need to try to write down all these URLs. But we will start with, with the big one that Mark Shane just mentioned. Uh, Google Reader is being pulled as of July 1. Uh, people are kind of scrambling to find alternatives. Uh, there's net vibes, blog lines. Um, basically, at this point, if you do a, and I, I almost don't want to say this, if you do a Google search for Google Reader replacements, uh, many people are writing articles about those. So just something, if you're not aware of it, you're a Google Reader user, that is something you want to um, keep an eye on. You will need some sort of new RSS reader in the next couple of months. Um, a few other things. The... Uh, LA County, uh, uh, LA County Metropolitan Museum, I, I believe is this, uh, LACMA, they have actually been photographing uh, many of the items in their collection and they have just provided over 20,000 free high quality digital photographs of items in their collection that you are, use, you are available to use for free, they're available to you. You can search, you can browse by object type, um, if you are looking for high quality photographs of historical objects for used in blog posts anywhere else on your website, um, this is a great site that you might want to take a look at. Um, also with that, I have found a new website called Pixabay, and this is um, also public domain images. Mostly leans towards clip art, I have found um, at the moment. I don't even have an uh, image coming up on their homepage. There is also photography in here. Here's one of a, a flamingo, all available for you to use. So we've got a couple of uh, image resources for you uh, uh, this month. Um, one other one I'm going to mention here. There's always a couple more, uh, but let's, let's see. Uh, the Secret Door. This is a very interesting site. You're going to hear some music kind of come up in the background here. And I'm going to go ahead and mute that. And you click on the door, and what this does is this pulls data from the uh, Google Street View project, but Street View inside buildings. So each time you go through the door, you get another uh, kind of high-quality online, scrollable and movable inside of a building. Sometimes the buildings are really nice. Sometimes the buildings are run down. But it, it just kind of... It's a very interesting way to explore and move around. And if I return to the door and open it again, I'll get a completely different one this time. And up here we are in a, a museum, in this case, uh, the Tate Museum in London from the looks of it. So it just, i I got to be honest with you, other than just kind of playing around and looking at really interesting places, not 100% sure of uh, what a library could specifically do with this, but I... Thinking back to what Mark Shane has been talking about, um, some sort of narration along with this would be probably spectacular. Uh, you just have to do a little bit of recording, a little bit of video to go along with that. So that is The Secret Door, um, and that is actually through a, a window company, I believe, in the United Kingdom. So an interesting uh, thing to do. Um, two others here that I have for you. One is a, a free online OCR service. This is something that I've played with a little bit. Uh, to be honest, I've gotten mixed results, but the idea here is that if you uh, have a, an image that you want to turn into text, 
you can upload that image and output it as either a PDF, a Word document, text document, or rich text format. Uh, it accepts JPEGs, bitmaps, TIFFs, and uh, GIFs for uploading. It does say here that as in guest mode without registering, it allows you to convert only 15 images per hour. But if you don't have the software that will do this, because that, sometimes that software can be a bit expensive, uh, this is a service you might want to try. Like I said, I have had mixed results. Um, the clearer the source, obviously, the better the OCR is going to come out. But um, it is something that you might want to try. And lastly, um, I want to mention this uh, new type of SD card. And so we're going to get a bit, bit geeky here on this one. This is a, a one gigabyte SD card called a worm card, or write once, read many. And the concept here is that you can write data to the card, and then you can read it back, but it can't be erased it stores the material securely and traceably. And is, if you look at the uh, product description down at the bottom, what they're kind of marketing it for is, um, say, police needing to take photos of an accident or of a crime scene and then ensure the integrity of those photographs so that they have not been manipulated and they are the originals that were taken on site. Um, Pricing, I'm going to scroll down here. I'm not sure there's actually pricing in here. These are not cheap. But I've been when, when I was shown this, I was kind of mulling over the idea of maybe a, another archival format for um, libraries with um, uh, digital content. Uh, they're also supposed to be good for something like 100 years of storage, things like that. Um, it's not magnetic. It's not uh, optical, so you don't have scratching. You don't have... Um, um, degradation of the magnetic media. Um, just something I'm kind of throwing out there, maybe something uh, if, if I uh, tweak a little interest might be something that you would want to take a look at. So with that, those are my links for this month and my news. So Google Reader being the big one. And uh, thanks, Mark Shane, for bringing that up. That reminded me I was definitely going to talk about that. So um, I'm not seeing any uh, other outstanding questions or comments from the audience, so I'm going to take this moment to, to thank everyone for attending and thank Mark Shane once again for uh, participating in this session. Uh, like I, I keep saying, he has given me a lot to think about, and I like it when that happens. Um, Encompass Live is every Wednesday morning, Central Daylight Time at uh, 10 o'clock, or, or Central Standard Time as, as the clock may be. Uh, we have upcoming sessions here. Get ready to celebrate uh, uh, El Dia de los Niños uh, next week. Uh, dig into reading, the, this year's summer reading program on April 3rd. And easing information anxiety, teaching information literacy strategies and skills for college readiness on Wednesday, April 17th. So you can find all of our recordings here on the Encompass Live site. Just Google that. Um, also, Encompass Live has a Facebook page. We welcome you to like us on Facebook and uh, join us there where we will post uh, uh, information about upcoming episodes, when the recordings are released, and um, as always, we are. if you have any idea for presenting, uh, whether yourself or somebody else you'd like to hear from at Encompass Live, please feel free to uh, send those in either via, via the Facebook page or directly to Krista here at the Library Commission. So with that, I'm going to say thank you to everybody once again. Uh, thanks for attending, and we will see you next week on Encompass Live.